Okay. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to um, convene the Parks and Open Space Committee meeting for July 20th, uh, 2017. First item on the agenda is courtesy of the floor. Is there anyone here to address council under courtesy of the floor? There being none. Um, <clears throat> because of uh, time and conflict, uh, we've been asked to rearrange the agenda that's been presented. Um, so the first... Um, presentation will be what's listed as Article 5 in the uh, agenda, and that would be the Friends of uh, Lake Mincy presentation. So, Mr. Cope, if you'd like to uh, introduce Sure, I would just like guest. to introduce uh, the new chair of the Friends of Mincy Lake group, John Mauser. He's a retired uh, um, teacher with Northampton High School and a long advocate for uh, stream restoration, and, and now he has a new lake project to work on as well. So uh, he's going to do a quick presentation for us. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I want to thank the committee for letting the Friends of Mincy Lake address you this afternoon. We're going to look at a quick PowerPoint. If you have a question, you can interrupt me at any time. This is going to be kind of fast. It's going to be sort of like a video, but with still pictures. Okay? Uh, the Friends of Mincy Lake just formed. Uh, we're looking at the lake itself right now. This is at its lowest place, where it was for the fish salvage operation, which, which occurred on June 5th and 6th. Uh, we're going to look at a couple things. We're going to look at some background material, which Jim Wilson presented to the committee. Okay? Uh, that 16-page outline that he produced is our backbone of what's happening at Mincy Lake. We're going to look at a map. We're going to divide it up into three parts, the West Bay, the Dam Pool, and Dam Breast, East Bay. We're going to look briefly at the fish salvage and we're going to look at the turtle salvage. There's two big questions that we do have to address that we need the committee to be aware of. Uh, it's a 311-acre lake. Uh, the dam and the resulting lake were constructed in 1970. Once again, this is all information in Jim's packet. Uh, it's 117 acres. Uh, the dam is 47 years old, and herein that's part of the problem. Uh, we have to update it structurally, and we also have to meet modern flood protection requirements. Those two items have to be addressed. The property itself that the Fish Commission and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania own is outlined in yellow. The Fish Commission plan, briefly, they have $4 million, but that's for dam reconstruction, period. The, Current and earthen embankment is 3,300 feet long. They're also going to raise it 2.3 feet. The lake has been drained since late May. Okay. Fish salvage, complete it. Project bids are going out September of 2017. Now, letter F is sort of a dream. I don't think they're going to hit it. They're saying that the lake might be refilled in 2019. That's their target date. Very optimistic. Okay, can I just ask a question? Um, yes, you may. The uh, fish salvage operation, how did that go? Do you have numbers, how many fish were well, saved? Well, we're actually going to look at that, John. Okay. okay? Right. So uh, that's later on, and we'll get to that. Okay. And that's an important thing because that's really important because it addresses some of the dilemmas we're having right now. And I have to share our two dilemmas with you, okay? Uh, let's just look at this for a moment. Jim Wilson... That's the Bible, okay? That's what we're following. Uh, Northampton County approached various groups to form the Friends of Mincy Lake, FOML. That's why I'm here, okay? The Junior Conservation School is going to be the 501c3 umbrella organization. Our object is to raise funds, help with the planning, and help with development. We're obviously guided by the Fish and Boat Commission and Northampton County. We have a voting board of 11 members. You'll notice that three of the voting members are Northampton County representatives, Gordon Heller, Brian Cope, Jim Wilson. I do not see us ever having a close vote. Basically, this is going the way North Northampton County is directing it. That's important to get across. Okay, here's where we're at. Northampton County has an open, Northampton County open space has a livable landscape plan. Mincy Lake fits right into that plan. That's number one. The group is developing a public education plan. And part of that 
is what you're going to see today. You're going to be seeing the education plan. Okay? Part one is to get the fish habitat improvement into the lake and make sure we're coordinating with the Fish and Boat Commission, for example, with the pedestrian walking bridge over the new 150 foot spillway. That has to be done in phase one to make sure we're compatible. Phase two, at that point, we're going to look at all the other infrastructure, okay? That's going to be more walking paths, improvements, bathrooms, things of that nature. And phase three, which is near and dear to Brian's heart, is how do we connect this to all the other recreational features that are in the Lehigh Valley, the Delaware Valley, actually? And he's going to be talking more about that. And that excites me also, okay? Because it really makes the assets that Northampton County has more valuable. Okay. In phase one, we're going to be looking at fish habitat. The main structures, now once again, this is in the public education program, the main structures will be rock rubble humps, there'll be some trees in there that are anchored, uh, there'll be porcupine cribs, and we'll talk more about that at another time. A big thing in phases one and two, we want to make sure that we have access for all, meeting our ADA requirements. Here we go to the public education part, okay? If I'm asked 19 questions or 20 questions, 19 of them, the first question out of their mind, are you dredging the lake, okay? Now, if they don't ask me that, Hayden, they say, what are you going to do with all those lily pads? So those are, those are the things I'm going to be sort of stressing today because this is what the committee has to address to the public. Uh, previous lake levels, uh, they average five feet. But that's deceptive because the area right by the dam was 26 and a half feet deep. Okay? So you can't go with averages. Averages look cute. Not what we can present to the public. Okay? A large portion of the lake, and this is part of our dilemma, is one to four feet deep which does promote an aggressive vegetation growth, okay? The lake was designed for a maximum volume of 584 million gallons. What that means is we have a certain capacity. We have to stay at that capacity or below because that's the structure stability design, okay? Well, under current regulations and permitting, the lake cannot be excavated below the original lake bed. And that makes sense. That keeps us within our maximum volume. Linda, you're going to have to tell me. I have a tendency to wander. So if I'm getting too far away, just point. And Brian has a tranquilizer dart gun, which will calm me down in a moment. Normal maintenance may include sediment removal, vegetation removal. But that's something you talk about afterwards. And it is part of our education program. Now, here's our dilemma. The lake is loaded with large, largemouth bass. Okay? It's loaded. There's a nice fish caught this spring. Here's a fish they caught, caught by anglers prior to the fish salvage. That was a little over seven pounds. Now, that's a trophy anywhere in the Northeast. This lake had a bunch of large, largemouth. What I'm telling you is the habitat was providing an excellent fishing environment for knowledgeable anglers. Now, unfortunately, knowledgeable anglers is the other point, okay? And we'll just move on from here. We're going to look at the lake. Once again, it's surrounded mostly by woodland. You can read that if you desire. This is all stuff in Jim's little 16-page item, okay? Lake Mincy has an ideal location. It's unbelievable. You'll notice the terrain around Lake Mincy in this picture. It is flat. Now that means the streams are low gradient, not much of a slope, not able to move large amounts of silt, gravel, cobble, boulders. Beautiful lake. We got two parking lots. We have two fishing jetties. A lot of neat infrastructure. We have over two miles of trail around the lake. At this point, we do not have a bridge over the spillway, so we can't have a completely enclosed trail system, but that's going to be addressed. 
Okay, we're going to break the lake up quickly into the West Bay, the Dam Pool, and the East Bay. And uh, the reason we're breaking up because we have three different types of habitats. The West Bay is extremely shallow, okay? When you look at it, here's our fishing pier. Now, if we had a choice to locate a fishing jetty anywhere, this might be the last place we put it because it's surrounded by water depths of one to three feet, okay? When we look around it, there is a deeper pool that was excavated around the fishing jetty. So it is deeper. The vegetation doesn't encroach there. And it's also adjacent to the boat launch, okay? We have the west parking lot right there with our modern Allstate Portage on. And you can see we have a little bit of vegetation which won't be killed until next winter. Okay? And this is part of what our education program needs to get out. This vegetation provides cover for the fish, the frogs, the minnows, the insects. It's ideal habitat if you're a fisherman and you have access to these areas. Okay? We're looking at the dam breast. We're walking towards uh, the we're walking towards the west parking lot right here. And here we are switching direction, going out to the fishing jetty too. You can see the terrain with the lily pads. You can see some glacial till sticking up. It's not covered up. There's not a lot of silt in the lake, and we'll talk about that. West Bay, very, very shallow. But the structure is very conducive to largemouth bass, sunfish, chain pickerel. So it's ideal in that respect. Uh, some of our infrastructure we'll be talking about in the future. Some of the benches need upgrading. The tables need upgrading. The grills need upgrading. And that's something Brian and Jim have addressed before you. Uh, the other fishing pier is in slightly deeper water. Bill Minio told me to look for the fish structure that they put in place 47 years ago. It disappeared. Okay. It, I don't know what happened to it. We're looking at the Lake Bob, West Bay. You can see the cobbles exposed. You can see the tree trunks. You can see you're not th sinking up to your hip in silt. Now, we can remove silt. Here we are looking at a different part of the lake bed. This is actually the East Fork Martins Creek. It's about two foot wide there. It has a little bit more gradient. It's narrow and it's relatively deep, about six to 10 inches deep. There's an old stone row right in there. And as we're looking around, you can see there's tree trunks, the ground's bare. It's a little depth. If people knew to fish in the stream where the stream channel was, they'd have a better chance to catch fish. Our fishing pier is a little bit too far away from the stream channel. And we're looking at an old rock structure right here. And we can sell you a canoe cheap. We're thinking of maybe using this as a raffle prize. This was recovered by Gordon Heller's crew. Okay didn't quite make it. Uh, we have very small tributaries, four of them, filling the lake. They're not moving a lot of sediment. I'm walking through this area and not sinking, okay? Here we start to see tree trunks. It's unfortunate when they made the lake, if they would have left the trees that they cut, we would have habitat and hiding places for fish and other creatures. But that in the 70s, this was done on all the reservoirs. You removed everything. Notice, the tree roots are exposed in that little stream channel. It's not covered with silt. It's not covered with a lot of vegetation. Okay? You look up here, it looks like somebody just tore up all the grass. Okay? Not a lot of muck. In some areas, you will start to build one to two inches of silt as you go north into the bay, closer to the tributaries. Whenever we get a rain, I did find some muck, okay? I'm standing in about four or five inches of muck, which would be silt and decaying vegetation. I didn't find a lot of area of that. There was, in the North Bay, I did go over, excuse me, the West Bay, right where East Branch or East Fork, Martins Creek comes in, I did find it up to my knees, okay? I was expecting it maybe to go a little higher. But there's not much silt or sediment or muck to be removed. Uh, 
The board's going to be discussing what is our strategy going forward. Okay? Heading back to the parking lot. You have glacial till. Those boulders were from the glaciers. Okay? You have dense lily pads. If the lily pads weren't there, in those shallows, any fish would be subject to an osprey or other critters that feed on fish. Okay? Without the lily pads, we're in deep trouble. We're going to go to the dam pool. And the dam pool does get deep, 26 and a half feet. But when you look out there, there is not much structure. Brian is going to widen uh, this walking trail. Okay? It will form a complete loop. We're excited about that. There is some fish structure right there. Okay? Now, I'm saying that rather sarcastically. Please forgive me. Uh, yep, it's four tires wired together with a concrete block. And yes, it does provide a little bit of habitat for a couple fish. But it's not enough. If you look at this bay, we're basically looking at a sink where all the water drains to. Okay? Now back there by that red arrow was probably a borrow pit where they took some soil to help build the earthen dam. Now it's deeper back there. We could put some fish habitat back there and it would be accessible to the people using the trail system if they didn't have a boat. Uh, looking at the rest here, uh, I'm just going to proceed a little bit. Here's the outflow. And nice outlet structure that's going to be replaced. This is the control gate. Uh, here's the underwater apparatus, the culvert that it drains through. Here it is at low, right when they were they opened the floodgates for the dam so they could catch fish coming through the culvert. And we'll look at that. But the fishermen were there all the time. The one person had taken 3,800 fish out of Mincy two weeks ago, and he was still going strong. He's putting them in another lake in um, Monroe County that he has that's 25 acres. Now, here's the neat thing. Here we have all, all kinds of rock rubble when the farmer was farming this area? Well, that's fish habitat. That'll attract insects, crayfish, small fish. But the problem is it's also in the deepest water in the lake. So it's inaccessible to most fishermen. And we're hoping to get our fish plan from uh, our fish habitat plan from the Pennsylvania Fish and Game Commission within the next week or two. And we'll update you when you would like updating. Uh, the dam pool looking to the northwest we're looking back into that west bay, which is very shallow. You'll notice there's not much there. If the dam breast would have had uh, R7 riprap, that would provide areas for fish and other aquatic creatures to hide in and would have nice fishing along the dam breast. Okay? As we move along, we're getting close now to the spillway. That'll be coming up. This is the spillway area which was basically only one foot deep, two foot deep max spillway area. Here's our spillway, which is currently 50 feet wide. It's not wide enough for the amount of water that comes into this reservoir. They want a spillway of 150 feet. So that's going to be increasing. We're going to jump over to the East Bay. Brian, how much time have I used up? Five minutes? Okay, we gotta, i got to speed up here. Moving along here. We, we're showing our trail segments in there. We're going to look at the East Bay. The East Bay has a lot of neat little things. Uh, there's varying terrain, and some of that might be borrow pits. There are fields where they were stacking up the cobble. Okay? Uh, we have some other people out there checking out right now. I had to make sure I kept on moving, looking alive. Uh, here we go. Farm row. And to the right is an old dirt road that was covered up when the lake was flooded. That's also good fish habitat, okay? And in the background, we see something. It's off the boat launch. Or, yep, the east boat launch. There it is. It's looking more like, I don't know. Oh, look at this. It's an old farm road with the farm bridge. That's great habitat. I'm glad they left that there, okay? Was that a county bridge at some point? <laughs> well, it, it might be one you might be looking to decertify, okay? Uh, this is looking upstream from that little bridge. Uh, okay, I can send that picture to you, John, if you need it for the next you can full send council it to meeting. Stan Rouge's Hill, check <laughs> okay. it out for us. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, we're, I'm just going down this little trib coming through the east branch. And if you fish in those tribs or around, the fish need something to be around. Okay? They need a structure. They need weeds. Weeds can be very important. Okay? Uh, there are some big boulders in there. Uh, here's that dirt road. Uh, these are areas that are great to fish, if you know where, they at, where they're at. You know, to the typical person coming to Mincy Lake, they're going to have no clue, Peg, okay? No clue. They're going to throw their line and say, hey, where are all the fish? And, and hopefully we can uh, put a little map out where these fish structures are. And that's done on a lot of lakes, okay? So there's things we can do. Here's a borrow pit, and they put some nice boulders in here. And this is neat. That one big dark one is almost as big as a Volkswagen. This is a good area to fish in is East Bay. We have depth. We have depth coming down. We have cover, okay? There were thousands of bluegill nests all around that area, okay? It was unbelievable. Thousands of them. But it was a little too far to cast from, <laughs> from the shoreline. And another depression might have been a borrow area. All those depressions are important. Uh, somebody was out duck hunting and apparently had a little accident. They dropped their gun overboard. Okay. People lost batteries, I hope not on purpose. Uh, a lot of anchors were in here. Okay. But this gets us to John. This is the big thing. And, and this is part of our big sell. Right now, I'm hoping I got across to you, there's not much silt in this lake. It's a small watershed, 3.7 square mile, small watershed, flat terrain. There is not a lot of sediment coming into the lake. That, you saw 47 years of sediment, okay? That sediment is on top of glacial till. If we decide to take, as a maintenance procedure, take the sediment out, we're gonna be scraping up glacial till. I don't know whose farm or yard you want to put that on. That's going to be a tough sell, okay? Excavating two to six inches over 80 acres of ground is not a fun job, okay? And if the fish are there, if we have habitat that is conducive to a good amphibian, reptile, fish population, we really shouldn't mess too much with it, in my mind. Now, on a fishing bum, and I, I guess I better get on with the salvage. Okay, we release the water out of the floodgate, okay? They netted the fish, they bring them to shore. And they brought thousands and thousands of fish to shore, but not all of them. There's a nice crappie, but you can't see it too well. It's about 12 inches, which is a really nice panfish. It's a member of the sunfish family. Okay, right here you can see, boy, they're having fun pulling those fish out. Now here, I gotta stop the picture. By a blue shirt, right above the badge. You see that tail? That's a rainbow trout. Normally they put rainbow trout in the lake just for winter fishing and they die. Well, that rainbow there is probably about 20 inches. They released a bunch of other trout into Martin's Creek. Okay? They had walleyes up to 30 inches long. Now, if you're a fisherman, that makes your eyes roll. Are you kidding me? 30 inch walleye. Now, they only caught seven to 10 walleyes. Walleyes prefer to spawn over gravel bottoms. Do we have a gravel bottom? No. We have a shallow lake. Some of the large mouths coming out of the lake. Most fishermen would be happy with those fish, especially that one right there. Okay? And that one there. Now, the fish are there. We're not selling the value of our recreational park. And I think this is something Brian and Gordon Heller and Jim Wilson are working on. We have to sell and publicize what the heck Northampton County has to offer. I just drove down 611 Frost Hollow, where you have that little parking area. Beautiful. I live on the Delaware River. Phenomenal. Okay, turtle salvage. We have red-bellied turtles. Now you're probably saying, big whoop, what does that mean? Well, it's a threatened and endangered turtle. We did recover some of those. That's a map turtle. 
and different turtle traps and bait, sardines and sweet corn, oh boy. Guess if you don't catch any turtles, you can just eat that stuff. Uh, painted turtles they got. There's Jim Wilson. I think Gordon Heller, Brian Cope, and Jim Wilson are really excited about this project. Uh, I think they are, are a very valuable asset to the county. There's all the turtle traps you can see in the lower right-hand corner. And this is kind of amazing. These are two large red-bellied turtles with transmitters on that they're letting go in a pond, and they're going to attempt to recover those and put them back in Mincy Lake. Okay? I, I think that's just amazing. Now, I know I'm walking into it rather deep tonight, and it's about time for me to take my canoe, which has no paddles, and an up a small creek, but I want to thank you for letting me talk to you this evening about the Friends of Mincy Lake. If you have oh. any questions, I will gladly answer them. Uh, the committee is willing to come back at any time you desire. We are very happy to be partners with Northampton County. I thank you for taking a role in the Mincy Lake and be a friend of Mincy. You're <laughs> you've been around a while and you've done a great job well, with everything you do. Okay. Yes. Yes. Good news about the silt. I know that uh -huh. they had big questions before they drained it, like right. what's it gonna look like? So not having a lot of silt to take care of is, is a boon. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's a very good thing. Now I told you there's two dilemmas. Yeah, I was going to ask about The two that. dilemmas are we're going, to, we're going to be going around to all the sportsmen's clubs, civic groups, giving talks. This is one of our big issues. We need people to understand this is a shallow water fishery. It's a very good shallow water fishery, okay? That's number one. Number two, with the vegetation, we can do a little bit of vegetation control around the boat launches and in a few other areas. However, vegetation control is expensive. It doesn't stop it. It's an ongoing process. And, and I think part of our education uh, uh, program with Mincy Lake needs to be, how do I fish it? What are my expectations? And I think that's something we can get out to the community. Will we make everyone happy? No. But that's why I'm here tonight so that you understand what we're going to be trying to do with the public, okay? That's too shallow to have catfish on the same catfish. Well, you can have catfish, yes. Uh, matter of fact, those tires make great catfish spawning areas. Hmm. And I don't remember Keith Beamer mentioning anything about channel catfish or bullheads. Now, there should be bullheads in there. Now, I will state this. They did not drain the lake completely. There was still a, a pond left. And catfish and channel catfish and carp have a tendency to not want to move until their backs are out of the water. Mm -hmm. So there's probably a sizable population in that pool above the dam breast yet. Okay. When I was a kid, I used to have an aquarium, and every once in a while, I'd have to clean it out. <laughs> and that, <laughs> this is like a gigantic version of <clears throat> cleaning out your aquarium. Yes, uh, it is. <laughs> but you tried for balancing in your aquarium, yeah, I, and we're pretty close here. Y yes, there's work to be done. Yeah, I guess then the final question I would have is um, what financial commitments are you looking for from the county? Uh, John, you've hit a very important question. I'm going to turn it over to Brian in a moment. Okay. Uh, the first thing is the fish habitat has to be in as soon as that dam is done. And... Uh, we're supposedly getting an estimate from the Fish Commission how much the habitat is going to cost. The habitat would cost probably seventy to a hundred thousand. Oh, okay. Uh, the Martin Jacoby Watershed Association has made a five thousand dollar donation to for habitat, but mm -hmm. and we haven't started going around to the other clubs yet. But if the county can jumpstart us with a habitat and then we apply for grants working through Brian and Gordon and Jim, uh, I, I think that would be a great start. Brian, uh, you want to finish up that question? I sort of ran around it. No, that's all right. So um, at one point in time, we probably will ask for some kind of commitment to, like John said, jumpstart um, seed money for grants and such. Um, we're kind of in limbo right now. I've had some conversations with the administration 
mostly around what to do with the municipal park money that may be coming at the end of September um, and the budget and putting it in for mm -hmm. 18. So we're working on some type of thing right now. Um, Jim Wilson's actually applying for a grant through Friends of Mincy um, for mm -hmm. habitat improvement. Um, as John said, $5,000 was already donated by uh, Martin's Jacoby Watershed Association. And they're, we're going to take this spiel on the road, um, Cabela's, Big Bass. Um, there's others out there that we can look for financial commitments as well. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, excellent presentation. We look forward to. <laughs> Very good. Bye bye, John. Okay, um, so then <clears throat> moving along, uh, again, rearranging the agenda. The uh, next item, because of time consideration, is the September 11th National Memorial Trail Alliance presentation. Brian, would you like to introduce our guest for that? Sure, I'd like to introduce Andy Hamilton. He is the new chair uh, at pretty, what, less than a month now? Maybe a few weeks? Um, he, he retired from uh, his position um, as a landscape architect doing trail projects all over um, the United States up and down. He was part of the East Coast Greenway for many years. He's on the Pennsylvania State Trails Advisory Committee for DCNR and uh, now he is the new chair for the 9-11 National Memorial Trail Alliance. Uh, Andy? Thank you. Good evening, how are you? Good Welcome. Afternoon. Good evening. Good to meet you in time. Um, Brian, I, for, first off, Northampton County, I really want to thank you for having Brian, allowing him to be on the advisory board for the September 11th National Memorial Trail. We, the board is something that is actually growing into a really national board. We have people from Colorado, Massachusetts, uh, North Carolina, and all points in between who are focusing in on this. We have an honorary board now that uh, includes John Lehman, who is the mm, former Navy Secretary Secretary. of the Navy and part of the 9-11 Commission. We're growing, we're building, and as of Tuesday, we have hired an executive director. So we are actually getting on the ground and running now, if you will. Not that we haven't been in the past, and, and I'll discuss what has occurred to date. Uh, and I just have a map instead of a fancy presentation. I've been doing a lot of fancy presentations, but uh, anyway, I, I apologize for not bringing up a shortened one because I have long ones. And I didn't think you wanted to sit through the whole thing. Um, so the September 11th National Memorial Trail is a, I'm, I'm good, I think I'm good. Thank you, Brian. It's a, it's a seven state and Washington, D.C. system of trails and roads today. And when I looked at it, without really drilling into maybe some smaller projects, right now, along this alignment, which includes the Pentagon, Shanksville, Flight 93, and the National Memorial in New York City, there are at least 10 development projects ongoing. Um, and they have been spurred on, most, almost almost every one of them has been spurred on because it's on the alignment of the September 11th National Memorial Trail. Communities along the way, such as Easton, such as Northampton County, such as all the other ones, are really, they're going to be connected to these national treasures that are there to remember for our children and our children's children the heroes of that day, the tragedies. And not the the political things that happen, but rather the perseverance and the quality of, of coming back together. And there's something beautiful about that. Um, David Brickley, who was the, we'll call him the grandfather, the uh, president emeritus is what we've given him the title of, um, just stepped down as board chair. He was uh, the DNR, Virginia DNR secretary. Uh, he had a huge conference in Virginia on September 15th, 2001, and you couldn't fly. A lot of people came. It was a national conference. At the end of that conference, the decision was, we have to respond to this. We'd like to connect people to a place. This is a pilgrimage trail, connecting people to these places. And not only does it connect to 
these three memorials. It connects to many other memorials. It includes the state memorial uh, as well as other county memorials uh, throughout the entire area. And as you look at this, and I should have stated this originally, I apologize, the red are road and the green are trail. There's a lot of work to be done, but again, there's already 10 projects going on. In 2015, we finished the alignment study from New York through New Jersey in both directions and from the water gap all the way to Flight 93 and to the, water, uh, and to the, the Great Allegheny Passage. Um, the strength of this really emotion, this trail, uh, was such that CSX actually donated 12 miles of alignment to Somerset County to help to build something near Flight 93. This, is, this, this trail crosses the aisles, if you will. Uh, right now it's in front of Congress with a resolution. It's been signed on by the head of appropriations, and that would be Congressman Freelandhausen and uh, also um, Congressman Schuster, uh, Transportation and Infrastructure, they're co-sponsors of that bill. We're doing this, we're beginning to do this in all the counties, and it's in front of this county as well, uh, and all the states. We already have it from Pennsylvania State, uh, both House and Senate. Um, this is something that people are getting behind. And really think of that, that community you know, over there or right here, all of a sudden being tied together on this. I took a ride from Flight 93 to Harrisburg on this alignment, the inaugural ride, and it stunned me how people were coming out. But now I want to talk about your, your area. Uh, I, I was busy. I couldn't ride this one little section here. I had meetings in New York. I came back. I jumped on the ride, met the people riding in Easton. We rode up to Tatami Borough. That really blew me away. One of the firemen there lost his brother in the South Tower. I think it was the South Tower. And, and I looked at that, that firefighter, and I said, we have to build a bridge for your brother. We have to build a bridge in Tatami for your brother. And then we rode up. And you know we had a big event there. Then we rode up to uh, to Wing Gap, had a huge event there, and then rode up to to Water Gap and had a huge event there. I mean, people really are embracing this trail, and we're really pleased that Northampton's focusing in on this trail. And really, the connectivity of the region is so key. Imagine linking Water Gap really all the way to Jim Thorpe, people will be staying in Easton. People will be, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those wonderful opportunities. I live in Bucks County. Uh, I chair the Bucks County Bicycle Task Force for the commissioners there and as well. And, you know, we're trying to bring people up to Northampton too with finally going from, and that's not on the September 11th trail, but this is, this is from Quakertown North to connect to the Saucon Valley Rail Trail. There's a lot of energy in connecting people, and uh, this one just right out of the gate. When you start talking about it, people, uh, it's it's amazing. And uh, Brian, I hope you might have some of the the photographs that you could share with them. Uh, and I apologize, I didn't bring a full presentation with all the flags flying in, in the different places. It's yeah, yeah, and it just takes your breath away when you when you see the impact of what it means to, you know, especially your, your, your emergency people uh, of every variety. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be working on it. I'm very fortunate to be working with Brian on it. Um, and, you know, you have assets here in the county. Uh, the Arts Trail, uh, it was zero degrees, I believe, on Valentine's Day. And I had the brilliant idea of bringing my wife up here to take a walk on that. And we did. It was a shorter walk than I suspected, but it was, you know, it's, you have wonderful assets here. Uh, and Mincy Lake was one that you were speaking of before, and, and the trails, the way they start to connect, is just phenomenal. Um, and I'm not going to have a long presentation. I know you have a long evening or afternoon 
time in front of you, uh, but I'm happy to ans answer any questions whatsoever. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. The liberty. Yeah. from Jersey City to um, the Portland Columbia footbridge in Portland. But from there up to the National Recreation Area is one that we'll be looking at and uh, I'll touch it base in my open space updates, but to give you a hint, um, I've had a conversation with the National Park Service. They're looking to secure funds with possibly us to do engineering from that point of the gap and down to the Portland footbridge along 611 to put a trail in there. Which would end that whole that, would be huge, that whole section. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's 165, 160 miles across New Jersey yeah. from there. Yeah. It's it's mostly trails yeah. through there. Uh, we are doing a huge project, uh, which is now known as the Essex, Huck, Essex Hudson. Mm -hmm. Uh, Greenway connector, which is a 14-mile project. When when this planning process was done in New Jersey, I went to DOT and I said, I see an issue, and I think I have a solution for you. Uh, and within a year, we had gone from that first phone call to a project that they're in the process of wrapping up right now. And that's going to take a look at literally a 14-mile trail from the Newark and Montclair areas all the way to the Hudson River. That's, that's huge. Usually a project like that would start to take three to five years to get off the ground. We had it off the ground in one year. People are really enticed by the, 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 the emotion of this trail. Uh, and it's, it's something that um, it's really for the future generations, you know. And it's for all the heroes and their families who, who lost their lives or their loved ones on that day. We each have our own, our own uh, story and feeling about that. Uh, one of our board, two of our board members lost, uh, lost loved ones. Uh, one was the youngest woman on uh, Flight 93. Uh, she was coming back from college early because she could get an earlier plane to get home to see her parents for spring break, but didn't make it. So, you know, it really is something that it, it honors something that's really significant in this era of, of American history. And it's also connecting pieces of history and resilience throughout its entire route. Okay. All right, so um, you're asking for a resolution of support this evening as well as a $5,000 grant from the uh, Livable Landscapes uh, funding? Yes. Um, I don't have any objection. Brian, did you want to add anything else to this? Uh, I just want to show you. Here's a, an example of what the signage would look like. This oh, okay. is overlay. This is part of the Liberty Water Gap Trail. I can pass this around. And let me just say that the very first sign, I, I should have said that. I've been He's running. I'm so that. tired, I apologize. I uh, finished my last presentation at 10 last night, and I was up at 5. Um, the, we just put, on the, put up the first signs uh, on the Patriots Path in Morris County uh, last Saturday uh, with uh, Congressman Freelandhausen uh, doing the unveiling. So, you know, we're, we're just getting the signage going. Uh, Northampton County could be one of the first counties, the first in Pennsylvania, to, to, to do this. And as Andy mentioned, most of this 9-11 trail overlays existing trails. We have the majority of it is already built, but we have significant gaps, such as the Tatami section um, that goes through three municipalities to connect up to Stockertown. We're working on the Two Rivers Trail Gap 9A, which is the connection from the Plainfield to Stockertown to Jacobsburg. And then um, getting up and across that northern tier will actually be a, a sub route of that, um, keeping it on the, the south side of the ridge as the trail goes across um, in the Cherry Valley and then the Delaware Water Gap comes back into Portland. 
and that's another section on um, the Liberty Water Gap Trail that connects up into the National Recreation Area is one other one that we really want to look at. So we want to identify these and uh, make the partners happen and work together to get this done. So with the 5,000, it would help go to some marketing um, efforts. We have some brochures and things that need a little updating, need but we need more. Yeah. And also we'd like to put in select areas where uh, the municipality and the trail owner would be um, receptive to it to put these types of trails out and get them out into the field. Okay. Um, recommendation for approval for later this evening? Okay. Okay, so we'll move it forward tonight uh, with a recommendation to Thank approve you. both the resolution and the grant. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Brian. We'll see you soon. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Hmm. Have a good evening. Thank you. Okay. Um, then the next item on the agenda is the uh, open space program updates. And um, Mr. Cope, I believe that's yeah, you. Just let me uh, pull up these PowerPoints. So I'll be uh, pretty brief. Um, is this it? Yeah. So I'm just going to kind of go back the last few months. I want to keep you guys updated as much as possible. But we just opened the Norbath Trail, the western connection of it. Now it connects to the DNL, um, just north of where they're going to be replacing the Leeds Street or the Copley Bridge um, that inter intergoes between Copley and Northampton. Uh, it's about a, a one-mile section. Um, it finalizes that part of the Norbath. And we're going to be working on the eastern section, hopefully have that completed by uh, 2020. It's kind of our goal. Oh, it went off? Oh. Okay. Better? Okay. So as I mentioned, um, June 16th, we had the official opening of the western portion of the Norbath Trail. It was a great event. We had about 30-some people there. Um, and people were using it even before we had the official opening. Um, it connects directly to the rec center that's down there. And then it's only about a block or two from the municipal building and the, the um, school complex for Northampton Area School District. So connects all types of different communities to these areas. And then also down to some other business district as well. It does. It, it crosses at Main Street where, where uh, there's not a light, but where the train tracks are, if you're familiar with that, right at. Uh, no, it's just the light's down below, and then there's a light up. So there's a light at the, the bridge, and then there's a light down at the intersection, the five-way intersection down below there. And there's a blinking light just below this crossing. But it actually goes down West 10th Street, which is a one-way um, coming up from the river. So they put on signage to get down to there. Very, very low volume road, um, maybe five cars a day, probably local that go through there. Yes, okay. on that small section, it's, it's on road. We had uh, the Delaware River Sojourn and the Lehigh River Sojourn come through our county once again this year. Uh, we had about over 300 participants within two and a half days that they were through the Delaware River on the Northampton County side. Um, you can see here the, let's see, the top left is up by uh, Sans Eddy, um, top right in, and the bottom right are both in Easton here, um, coming into the Two Rivers Landing Area and the, and the Free Bridge. And then the bottom left is uh, Doe Hollow, I believe, um, the gap there. Uh, so great sights to get out there and see, and, and to see all of these kayaks floating down the river. It's pretty amazing. We had the uh, Lehigh River Sojourn. They, had, they were also within Northampton County for two days, um, all the way from Lehigh Gap Nature Center all the way down to Easton. Um, there's different sections. There's actually an island um, just north of Humor Park. That's actually, sorry, part of Humor Park that you can paddle into. It's pretty neat. I've never been there. It's the last section of the Lehigh River I've had to do, and I was uh, able to finalize it. But um, I like the top left, or the top, yeah, the top left picture. Uh, it's never too early to get kids out on the river. Um, we had our 
eight-year-old uh, stepdaughter um, out on the river with us, and uh, she kept saying it was like Space Mountain going through the rapids. So, and Pirates of the Caribbean when we were going past the different things. So I was like, all right, when you go to Disney again, uh, think of the Lehigh River this time. So it was neat to have her out. The uh, Two Rivers Trail Gap that I just mentioned, uh, we are putting this out for permit. It'll be Monday. Uh, they'll, they'll put it out. Um, the Conservation District uh, just kind of got a hold of us and said what's going on. They had a request from DEP. So our engineers uh, are finalizing all the requirements and we're putting that out to play. The Northern Tier Study, we had our first kickoff committee meeting and we have our next one next uh, Thursday on the 27th, I believe it is. Um, it's at Weona Park, uh, their community center there. Um, we've been having some great conversations with uh, some major partners that would uh, like to invest either time commitment um, or financial commitment in this area. Um, and we've also had a really good turnout from municipal officials, uh, local people, and the, en or the, the planning consultants that we've hired have been doing a, a tremendous job, and I really can't wait to see their final product and even the next product at the next meeting. What, what's the timetable on that? I think we have a nine-month contract with the uh, consultants, and what I think we wanted to do was get it far enough in the planning process that we could possibly apply for a, a DCNR grant in April. Mm -hmm. So if that time frame holds out, we should be able to get at least a, a section um, out for grant to help build in 19 or 20. So we can expect uh, a product and a presentation sometime Spring, early summer, early next year? spring. Yes, yeah, so spring, Mayish. I'm thinking. Okay. Um, definitely, they'll have to come in front of council to adopt mm -hmm. the plan. So we'll have that presentation definitely for you. Um, one of the neat things that we're looking at this, and it kind of overlays what the planning has been done for the 9/11 trail. We want to open this trail from the very beginning after adoption. Um, so we want to start marketing it. But we want to look at it not just as that 12-foot multi-purpose trail. We want to look at old country roads for a bicycling tour. Um, we want to look at type of an area for a vehicular tour for scenic view sheds or connecting farmsteads into the um, and back into the downtowns. And then eventually, over probably 30 years until the trail gets built in, in that world, um, we'll have that connection east and west to the Delaware River and, and the Lehigh River, the DNL and the Liberty Water Gap Trail. So hopefully, it doesn't take 30 years to build the whole thing, but. <laughs> We never know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. That'd be forever. Yeah. Right. And, you know, going with the marketing aspect of it, you can get into those historic downtowns like Bangor or Wingap, and in the fall you can have that, yeah. the fall foliage tour. Um, either for, like, the, the bike riders that are more experienced, they don't mind riding um, country roads or on-road riding, um, but families coming through and out can go there and have, like, a bite to eat and go out and see the fall foliage, stop at a pumpkin patch along the way or whatever else. But, yeah, that directly goes into what we were trying to do. Um, we applied for two different DCNR grants, both the um, Norbath Overall Enhancements Project and um, uh, signage for all our county parks. We should find out fall, late fall, early winter, um, depending on how everything goes with the state budget but we never know. It could be a time frame from October to January. So we'll have to wait and see about those two. We had the John Mauser talk about the Mincy Lake Conservation Corridor. Um, we had a really good uh, partner meeting with uh, National Park Service, um, Nature Conservancy, county employees, uh, friends of Mincy, and uh, Wildlands Conservancy, and we all kind of sat in a room up at Tots Gap, and we wanted to look at this corridor as more of an area, um, how we can connect things in between the National Park area, the southern edge of it, um, the whole Mincy Lake corridor, and not just kind of randomly put either parking lots or trailheads or things like that. So we had a really good conversation, and uh, we hope to move that forward. So we're thinking a little bit more regionally than just that 
simple area. Uh, a few dates to remember that are upcoming big um, events. We, this Saturday we have the third Leah Valley Greenways Festival. This year it will be held at uh, South Whitehall Township's Covered Bridge Park. Um, they have a large Flower Heads concert starting at 7. The event starts at 4. There's all types of events for kids and such. There will be nature hikes. There's a Hike It Baby um, that Appalachian Mountain Trail um, is doing at 3 o'clock. There will be a nature hike at 5 o'clock. There will be stream studies um, and all types of other events there. The uh, 1st and 2nd of August, uh, Cindy Adams Dunn will be coming in. She's the secretary for PA DCNR. And uh, on the 1st, we'll actually be meeting at Jacobsburg to go over a bunch of issues um, that are within Northampton County, mainly some of these trail gaps, um, the Mincy Project, and a few others. So I can pass that out to you guys if you would like to attend. And uh, I'll make sure you get it when I have the finalized version of when exactly she'll be there. Yeah, send it to me. I, I, if I'm free, okay. I might go. Great. My backyard. Okay. Uh, the PA State Trails and Greenways Conference, it's not in our area, but it's close. It's in Reading this year. That's the 24th to the 26th. Um, the River Unites Us, and I'll talk about this a little bit after this, but it's a geotourism conference. It's the first one that we're ever going to be doing. Um, it's part of the Scenic Wild Delaware River Geotourism Program. Uh, it's September 28th. It's up at Woodlock Resort, which is up towards um, Hawley, uh, Wall and Paul Pack area. And where we have uh, Jim Dion from National Geographic coming back in. Uh, Woodlock Resort. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's nice. Um, so Jim Dion was with National Geographic. He's now with Solomar International. He's the one that put this whole program together. He'll be speaking. And we actually have one of the other uh, geotourism programs come in uh, from the Tennessee Valley. So she's going to talk about how they started their whole program. They're about six years ahead of us right now. So she's going to talk about how they started, um, ways they've seen improvements over the years and things like that. Those are our two keynote speakers. And then we'll have breakout sessions for sustainable practices, so conservation, um, green building, and things like that. And also a marketing. Um, track that would look at small business development, um, tourism initiatives, and things like that. So it's a one-day conference. We're hoping it goes pretty well, um, and we'll see how it, it does after that. The uh, last one is the October 27th. It's the Lehigh Valley Watershed Conference. It'll be held at Lehigh University again. Um, this is run by the Lehigh Valley Watershed um, Association. I think it's their seventh um, one that they're doing. So it, it's pretty uh, well attended, and uh, I know they do a great job with it. So that's that for the updates. Is there any questions on anything that's going on right now? I keep asking this question. On the North Bath Trail, mm -hmm. when I first came, we were talking about putting wigwags at, on Airport Road and Weaverville Road and on Savage Road. I forget what road is there's, there. there's a few of them. What, yes. Yeah, what, where, do we are, where are we with that? What, um, what's, is there a hold up? Is there money? I thought we were. We have the money secured. That's what I thought. Yeah, the money is in the budget. And uh, from what I understand, that there's a few easements that need to be um, hashed out with landowners because they're not fully in our right of way or PennDOT right of way. So the negotiations are still happening from. Uh, I'm not fully involved with that one, but that's what I understand. So hopefully that uh, it gets resolved pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Any questions on the uh, open space updates? Okay. Uh, then the next item is the uh, Rabitsky Fee Simple Acquisition Resolution 45-2013 amendment. What was that and what are we doing? That was... The Rebitsky was a fee simple acquisition. Um, it was originally two parcels up in the Mincy Corridor. The landowner passed away. The children did not want to sell the, the northern portion across the road. Um, They're going to put a house on that for themselves. But the southern portion was sold to the uh, Nature Conservancy. In the uh, resolution, it, it just didn't say up to the amount, so we have to go back and uh, amend it for the lesser amount of about $2,320 just to amend that resolution so it could get paid out then. 
Can I ask a question, John? Yeah, certainly. Go ahead. Um, we're, we're, how come it says that um, it, it seems like it's for the, for this um, for these acres um, with the uh, twenty six point eighty one acre point eight one acres it it's going from a conservative easement to a fee simple? No, it was never in a conservation easement. It was it was private property. The Nature Conservancy is purchasing that property straight so, out. Straight out. There will not be easement on it. The Nature Conservancy will own it and add it part of their Bear Swamp Preserve, which is adjacent and congruent to the whole Mincy Lake Corridor area. Mm -hmm. So this has already been finalized. They've already had the agreement of sale. They already signed it. This is just a reimbursement back to the Nature Conservancy. And that, if I'm doing the math right, that's at like $6,700 per acre. But that's fee simple. That's, that's fee simple. That's, that's not the easement. ownership going. Right, right. Because I was comparing that to what we did at um, the J Deputy and John Right, Walton, that was a conservation easement. Which was a conservation easement. And so for a conservation easement, um, it was 3000 It's about half of that. That's normally assumptions correct. Okay. Makes sense then. I, yeah, I, I didn't get that this was um, a fee simple, so we're just giving it to... Now, just remind me, Brian, a little off track a little bit, but this, this um, J. Deputy and John Walton, it, it, in a resolution, it doesn't say who takes ownership of it. Does, does that title for the encumbrance on it, I hope I don't mess up this language, but that development rights is held by the county then? This didn't go to conservatory? Mm -hmm. We, we have language within the deed that if anything happens, it would revert to us or the state because this, I believe the state has funding in that one as well. Mm -hmm. They do, yeah. So there's clauses in the deed that would happen, but the Nature Conservancy will be the holder of that. Easement. Oh, no, excuse me. The uh, That John Walton and Jay it's just Deputy. It's municipal. It's, and, yeah, it's just it's okay. municipal. Municipal put up a hundred grand, let's say, roughly, and we put up 90 grand. Okay. So there is the clause that if anything happens to that property, we have to be notified or it could be reverted back to us. We do something similar. Or we, we do a similar program with the open space conservation easements is where we fund um, land, uh, land uh, conservancies or other municipalities to preserve the land in perpetuity by taking away development rights, which is very similar with the farmland preservation. We don't hold the easement because we don't have the – people to go out and do the maintenance, um, the inspections, the um, overall yearly in, um, just uh, overlook of the property. So that's something that differs between the, the yeah. farmland preservation and the conservation easement. The land conservancies have that capabilities. They have that um, ongoing uh, network that they work with. So that's where it differs, but it's still about the same. Yeah. So. I, I still am on this J. Deputy and John Walton. Then who, um, who, who holds the title to the? Who has the ownership of the um, conservative easement for that property? That's the J. Deputy and John Walton. So the landowners, J. Deputy and 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 Walt, Deputy and Walton. Yeah, they're they own the land they, right God, now. Yep. Mm -hmm. They will own that land, but they cannot build on it. So right. the the easement portion is held by the Nature Conservancy. Okay. The Waltons and and Deputy Walton, um, they can sell that land at any time, but that conservation easement is tied to the deed, which cannot be developed in that area. Okay. And comparing that to what we're looking at here for the Rosinski. And this is fee simple. That's it, just, they, it's straight out. That family will have no ties to that parcel. Correct. It would be like you selling your property to someone else for yeah. this one. Okay. Um, but what the Nature Conservancy does is they put in the deed in their clauses that it cannot be developed. It's mm -hmm. for preservation. So. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else on the Rabitsky? Okay. Uh, do we have a recommendation to move that this evening? Okay. Um, so recommendation to uh, pass that later this evening. Uh, next item we have is a discussion regarding the Scenic Wild Delaware River Geotourism Initiative.
So as you know, the uh, Scenic Wild Delaware River Geotourism Program is a, in association with National Geographic. It's one of 24 that was um, built by National Geographic internationally. We are one of only two um, on the East Coast. There's one that's called Box to Lakes, which is up in the, the northern region of uh, New York. And then the other closest is uh, the Tennessee Valley one, which is about three different states, nine area county, which is kind of similar to our region. Um, the river, or the, the region itself, is about 150 miles of the Delaware River from Hancock, New York, down to East and Peaburg area. Um, it encompasses nine different counties with about a 30-mile stretch um, from the river itself. So with that, there's been a, a geotourism uh, stewardship council that's been developed, and we created a vision for um, our overall expectations and um, for the Stewardship Council. So it's really to promote regional and local understanding of geotourism, engage local um, locals to provide a distinctive, authentic visitor experience. Um, it highlights the integrity of place, so it really focuses in on the local um, people who work or play or live in this area. Uh, it creates a nationally and internationally branded destination, uh, so it looks to bring in uh, geotourists, which are people that are um, they want to stay a little bit longer. They want the authentic place to go and spend their time, either um, to hike, bike, uh, kayak, canoe, or to listen to local uh, music or see local art. Um, as I said, it's a three-state area within New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, and it encourages some of the best practice practices available to keep the area as it is. So here's a quick... Uh, structure of the Geotourism Council. I chair the Stewardship Council. I have two vice chairs that are representative from New York and New Jersey. We have about a 35 to 40 member um, a full Stewardship Council with an 11 member Executive Council. Um, and then we have these subcommittees. We used to have five, but due to some overlapping of uh, projects and who should do this and who shouldn't do that, we um, narrowed them down to four. So we have a strategy and funding committee that looks at um, sustainable financial um, commitments to keep this uh, project going. We have a marketing and promotion committee, which I'll touch on later, but it really looks um, uh, the biggest partners are our four DMOs, our district um, destination marketing organizations, such as Discover Leah Valley, Pocono Mountain Visitor Bureau, um, the Catskills, and um, what's called Skylands in northern New Jersey. We have a sustainability and outreach committee that looks at uh, green practices, open space conservation, um, trail development, and getting the word out on those types of things through education and outreach. And then we have a website editorial group which really focuses on the map guide, which is the live website where you can build your itineraries and people put up their um, various locations or businesses. So since this thing was launched in uh, last May, um, we've really gone uh, I think we've really gotten very far to what we've been doing. We've created um, marketing tools. We have a, a hashtag that people use now for either Facebook or um, Instagram or Twitter. Um, we have over 700 sites that are now live with on that map guide. Um, so those are local businesses, events, places to go out and hike, bike, whatever. Um, we had four rollout events in, in each state in PA, New Jersey and New York, and then we also had a big event out in New York City. Um, we have a three-year strategic plan that we worked on uh, last fall, and now that is adopted, and that's guiding our practices. Um, we've reached out internationally, nationally, regionally, and local um, through our various marketing techniques, and uh, we've seen an increase in map guide users. So I want to touch on a little bit all of that to show you how we've been progressing over the year. Here's some photos of the New York City media blitz. Um, we were able to use National Park Conservation Association's headquarters in downtown Manhattan. Um, it was a great event. We had about a two-hour uh, presentation. We had computers set up so people can see what was going on. The reason we did this, instead of having the media come out to our region, we figured it would be a lot easier to go to them and have them there. And we had over uh, 20 different media outlets represented at this event. We've uh, won different awards and recognitions from all over um, the area, different, um, all three states. 
Uh, Lehigh Valley Awards won the Excellence in Planning. This was this past year in 2016. Um, so as you can see, it's been broadcast, it's been awarded, um, people are behind it. When we had that New York media event, the next day on Yahoo's website, it was National Geographic and Partners unveil Scenic Wild Delaware River, America's newest travel destination. That was on the headlines on their webpage the next day. So we did get some hits out there, and it was a good event that showcased what we were doing. We continue to uh, help out the community as much as we can. Um, we are sponsoring some of the river events, such as the Delaware River Sojourn that I showed you earlier. Kitty Tending Cleanup was, I believe it's in about its 26th year now, where they do it within the park. Um, they have 50 to 75, I, mean, I think maybe 100 this past year, participants that go out and do river cleanup, um, up and down the river in different stretches. Um, we also do, um, we helped with the 100 Mile Paddle Challenge, which was part of the uh, National Park Service's 50th anniversary last year that looked at the entire stretch of the river. Um, if you did it, you got some awards off of it. We've also been heavy within our conservation initiatives to keep this area um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a place that we would like to see it. So geotourism really focuses on um, the nature of the place. And we have great assets here, as I've told you many times. But um, we held a, gr a really good meeting with uh, Cindy Dunn and a couple of her staff up in the Upper Delaware area, um, Pocono Mountain Visitor Bureau, National Park Service, um, and National Park Conservation Association. We're all around and we talked about how we can uh, help promote this area um, through our guidance and, and our partnerships. Um, Upper Delaware Council is doing this Bring Home the Butterflies. They are doing mini grants up there and doing a lot of pollination um, restoration projects, similar to what we're doing here. But they have this really good, um, great brochure that they're expanding on the Upper Delaware reaches and they're focusing in on the monarch butterfly. I think everyone can get around a butterfly as kind of a, a symbol. So they have that, and uh, how much time do I have? I five minutes. Want to, five minutes? Okay. I'm going to take two minutes because I just want to show you a video that one of our partners, the Delaware Highlands Conservancy, um, teamed up with Mark Ruffalo. And if this works, do we get the internet? It might not work. I'll just keep moving on. Spinning circle of death. And that's not good. All right, I'm going to restart and I'm not going to go to that video. So we've presented at a few conferences. We had um, a keynote speaker, Jim Dion, and myself presented at the Eastern Pennsylvania Trails Greenways Conference, which was at ArchQuest this past fall. Um, it was a two-day event. Uh, it was one of the, a really good program. Um, there's been a speaker at the Coalition of the Delaware River Conference last year. And as I said, we are doing our first ever geotourism conference um, through the Scenic Wild Delaware River this year which is called The River Unites Us. Uh, we've done international, national, um, not including the local um, marketing campaign. Here's a, a overview of where our DMOs have been um, throughout the country at many summits um, that showcase large, uh, like Motor Coach or um, Travel Magazine, AAA, things like that where they're out there representing them themselves, but they also represent the Scenic Wild Delaware River. So working with our DMOs has really been a fantastic partnership. Um, they've bought into it heavily, um, and it just showcases the region as, as a whole. So within this past year that this whole thing's been um, created, marketed out, um, and broadcast, we've increased 
website users, as you can see, the bottom, the orange line, was uh, a, our baseline that was right around June of last year when after we uh, put it out for uh, uh, advertising and, and marketing. And the blue line shows uh, about, the, about the same time frame this year. So you can see there's been an increase of users using the, the map guide. And this is all through our Google Analytics that I don't have a, really much of a clue about. I let that to the other experts in it, but they tell me that's good to see. So um, there's been an increase in our Stewardship Council partnerships. We've had the DNL come on board, um, Appalachian Mountain Club. So those are two more within the region that are uh, committing um, their time to help us out. There's been local municipal partnership, the Upper Delaware has been uh, doing, Upper, Upper Delaware Council has been doing outreach to local towns and municipalities. Um, they're up to about 15 different resolutions of support um, within that area. So once again, we're just trying to get out and show, um, get support for the project itself. And we, as the Scenic Wild Delaware River, was, we're part of the uh, National Geotourism Council, but since they've been doing some restructuring, it's now the International Geotourism Council, which really focuses on Mexico, the United States, and Canada. So when we talk about this scenic wild Delaware River, we're in comparison with the Gulf states, Yellowstone, um, Sierra Nevada, uh, the Cascades. So we really put ourselves on the map with this whole thing. Any questions? No, I think that about covers it and we have two resolutions here they look almost alike and I'm yeah. having a hard time figuring out which okay is, what's um, the difference sure I believe that one is to um, uh, resolve to support the initiative and then the other one is for a specific grant of five thousand right. dollars similar to what the 9-11 yeah did. there's two resolutions Now, which one mentions the $5,000? Uh, it would be under the now, therefore, I believe. The second Got you. one. Got you. Okay. okay. So the, the first resolution would be um, that the county would um, support the, you know, the initiative, and then the second one would be the $5,000 grant uh, for the initiative. Any other questions on the uh, scenic and wild? Okay, uh, then do we have a recommendation to um, move it forward and approve it later this evening? Okay, three to zero. Okay, um, anything else for Mr. No. Cope? Any questions? Okay, uh, there being none, uh, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. And we'll be back in about 10 minutes for the Human Services Committee. And I remember when this was designated.